Good evening. Welcome to this evening at the University of Oxford's Water College Alumni event. I'm Stephen Reed, one of the organizers of tonight's event. The idea of this event was born earlier this year during conversations with Julie and Warren in London at another Wadham event focused on access and social mobility. Reflecting on that event and our conversations, I realized how spectacular my academic experience had been at Wadham. At Wadham, intellectual truth is an absolute, a core value, which is encouraged and enabled. As we all know, in Silicon Valley, intellectual truth is also a core value that is imperative to innovation and success. Thus, the opportunity to bring Wadham and Silicon Valley together for a collaborative discussion and to further enable intellectual truth in regard to complex, global, technology-driven trends such as the Fourth Industrial Revolution, the evolutionary role of artificial intelligence, the reach and scale of the Internet of Things, the resulting hyper-converged, always-on world, and ultimately, what the effects will be on our societies, our communities, our families, and ourselves. I'd like to introduce everyone to our host this evening, Julie Hay, Fellow and Development Director at the University of Oxford, Water College. Thank you very much, Stephen. It is my great, great pleasure to welcome all of you very warmly this evening to a very exciting opportunity to debate one of the most topical questions we can imagine here in the Bay Area. Um, it really does feel like the future is here and now, and I can say this because I'm visiting from the UK. Um, innovation, change, new ideas, it all feels very, very palpable in this part of the world. And so we're absolutely delighted that all of you have decided to come here this evening to discuss what the future uh, and what the so-called fourth industrial revolution might bring. Um, at Wadham and across Oxford, it's one of our key objectives to facilitate uh, a meeting of minds, bringing people from the college and across the university together. Uh, and tonight is a very special uh, such occasion. Um, the panel we have here this evening is an absolutely wonderful example of uh, the fantastic pool we have to draw from. Um, and I have to say that this event sold out in less than 48 hours and there's a long waiting list. So thank you for being here and you're also lucky to have a seat. Um, but, but we're really thrilled uh, that these wonderful people could come to talk to us this evening. Um, and, and not only were all of you, uh, you're a wonderful example of, of the expertise Wadham and Oxford has to offer, uh, but also you were very quick and keen to engage with us. So as Stephen mentioned, I, I spoke with Warren in January at some point and Warren said, I'll come over from the UK, um, happy to meet Wadham and Oxford alumni if that's of any use. And um, little did we know that we had an AI expert and Stuart Russell across the Bay at Berkeley University, also a Wadham alumnus, who has been instrumental, uh, and thank you Stuart, for helping us orchestrate this whole uh, debate tonight. Uh, and Stuart was very quick at saying, well, Murat uh, has just opened up this exciting new World Economic Forum Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. What could be more, possibly more relevant? <laughs> so Murat, although you're not a Wadham alumnus, your mother was at St. Hilda's College? That's correct. Yes, and we're delighted that you're here. And I came evening. all the way from the Presidio. Yes, the all the way from across <laughs> San Francisco Bay. <laughs> And, and Kathleen Sullivan, bless you Kathleen, uh, when you heard about this wonderful lineup, uh, you enthusiastically and graciously said, I'll jump on an airplane from New York and come and facilitate this debate. Kathleen has previously uh, facilitated a discussion about women and the law for Wadham, also a sellout debate. And we're absolutely delighted that you're here this evening. Um, but before I hand over to Kathleen and formally introduce her as well, I just wanted to say a very special thank you to our sponsors for this evening, the people and the organizations who've made this event possible and this meeting of minds possible. 
Uh, so to Toshiba America and to Daisho Group, we are absolutely delighted and very grateful for this opportunity to bring people together and to discuss something that is very, very meaningful and important to us. So we welcome you and we thank you from everyone at Oxford. Thank you. And finally, our distinguished chair deserves proper introduction. <laughs> we'll keep it very short, but there, there are a couple of firsts associated with Kathleen. She was the first woman of any American Law 100 firm. Uh, she was the first woman dean of any Stanford school for, when she headed up Stanford Law School. Uh, she was the first honorary fellow at Wadham College, Oxford. Um, and uh, often your name is often popped up under the Obama administration as uh, potential Supreme Court nominees and so on. Um, but you. Good thing that's over. <laughs> <laughs> no need to worry about that. We're absolutely delighted that you're here, Kathleen, and I'll hand over to you and let you manage the battle and the debate. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julie. Thank you so much, Julie, and thank you all for being here. I, of course, I got on that plane because the years I spent at Wadham College, Oxford, were absolutely magical and uh, key to everything that happened to me afterwards. So I'm very happy to be here and to be with my fellow Wadham alumni. Uh, I, I want to just begin by setting the stage because you have a phenomenal panel here and my job is to facilitate the conversation. But I just wanted to begin by setting the stage with what our topic is about. Uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and is it part of the fourth industrial revolution. And I was struck in just preparing for the panel that the New York Times ran a story a few days ago. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, although you may not be familiar with what I'm holding. This is a piece of paper newspaper. I'm still a hard copy girl. Um, but the headline was, in a win for AI, Google program humbles master of a mind-boggling game. And this was the report on just game one of the contest between AlphaGo uh, a product developed by DeepMind, the artificial intelligence arm of Google's parent alphabet, and uh, a, a Chinese Go master named KG. And he played three games against AlphaGo, and the report of the first one was that the machine won, AlphaGo beat KG, and his comment was that last year it was still quite human-like when it played, but this year it became like a god of Go. So that's a rapid acceleration in the power of the computation. But I understand from Stephen that actually he lost games two and three to the machine as well. So it was three and O for AI. What do we mean by AI? What do we mean by artificial intelligence? Uh, roughly speaking, it's a, a broad term that could encompass any number of technologies that let computers and robots solve problems in a way that in some broad sense resembles human thought. But there are many variations on AI. There's a distinction we may talk about between machine learning and deep learning. Deep learning being when the machine can start teaching itself through the application of software. Uh, and it, it means far more than just the ability to beat a Go master at a game. Of course, the same algorithms and computational techniques that marry computational power to big data can help create efficiencies in industry, uh, can create new solutions to healthcare problems, can promise the potential to actually, re through computational power, make better diagnoses or a better understanding of human molecules. So there are many highly practical applications that we can talk about tonight. But of course, it raises the question, is this kind of artificial intelligence, is it the fourth rev revolution? Is this to be compared to the advent of steam, the advent of electricity, the advent of computation to begin with? Is it a fourth industrial revolution, or is that an overstatement? Uh, is it really just a form of incremental uh, development in the third revolution? And we should talk also about whether it's a good or a bad thing for society. Is this something that will lead to greater abundance, the elimination of all kinds of laborious, repetitive, rote human conduct that gets in the way of the higher things? Or is it a way of hollowing out the economy and destroying jobs and leaving people with really nothing to do but to take care of other humans? So those are the questions we'll explore. And to explore them, we have a truly phenomenally distinguished group of speakers. 
Uh, immediately to my right is Professor Stuart Russell, Wadham Physics. Uh, Wadham College with, studied physics there. He's a professor of computer science now at Berkeley and one of the leading AI researchers in the world. Next to Stuart is Warren East, whose present job is chief executive officer of Rolls-Royce. He was previously a, a storied chief executive officer of ARM Holdings, and he, ha, again, holds the key to all things that are really good in life, a Wadham College background, <laughs> Wadham engineering uh, degree. And next to Warren is Murat Sanmez, uh, who is currently at the World Economic Forum after a long career in industrial engineering, took his degrees from uh, Bosporus University and Virginia Tech, and is currently the director of the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution at the World uh, Economic Forum. I'm not sure if I have that title right. But, Perfect. Okay. Yes. Well, uh, you have much more detailed biographies in the program, but we'd li I'd like to start by posing a question to each of you just to get the ball rolling. Murat, could you start by helping us with the definition? What is artificial intelligence, and is it the source of the Fourth Industrial Revolution? Is that a fair name? Um, if you look at the fourth, uh, thank you, Catherine. If you look at the fourth industrial revolution, and if you go back in history, the first one, as you mentioned, was the uh, facilitated by, catalyzed by the advent of steam engine. Then came electrification. Then came in the 90s computerization, and the fourth wave, which is what we call the fourth industrial revolution, is a combination of uh, technology, scientific developments, new business models happening all at the same time. Artificial intelligence is not new. I took my first AI course in 1987. So this uh, concept has been around, but now we have this thing called the internet that connects, used to connect people, now it's connecting the things, and it's a great amplifier and accelerator. So the fourth industrial revolution is different from the first three by its speed, scale, and scope. So we have developments in obviously machine learning, with internet of things, with big data, with new materials like graphene, we have drones, autonomous vehicles, we have precision medicine, we have probiotics, we have new business models like a shared economy, and this is all happening all at the same time. And it's redefining industries, redefining uh, geopolitics, redefining what it means to be a human. So we see this fourth industrial revolution happening very, very rapidly. And as we saw in the uh, example of Go, actually DeepMind was created by two students uh, in the UK. One of them was a uh, Oxford student for a while before he dropped out and co-founded the uh, uh, technology. So it was not Google that created the technology. It was uh, driven by two entrepreneurs out of the UK. And we're now seeing the tipping point when all of these are converging and happening all at the same time. And it's going to happen much, much faster than we, I think we all think it will happen. So you think the moniker fourth industrial revolution is accurate? We think so because it is the fourth wave of uh, change driven by scientific and technological development, uh, but it is much, much, much bigger, much, much, much faster and wider in scope than what we have seen uh, previously driven by a single development, uh, steam engine, electrification, computerization. Now we have a whole bunch of technology scientific developments all happening at the same time. Stuart, take us inside the university and let's hear about where the academic research is and to the extent you want to also comment on the role of industrial research and what, whether universities and industry are competing in the research or collaborating. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, certainly in terms of uh, following the money, uh, it's happening in industry. So the federal government puts in a few hundred million a year uh, into AI through the National Science Foundation and the Defense Department. Uh, Google probably spends that much in a month. Uh, and then we have all the, all the other large corporations who, who are doing this. Um, so AI has been around, the, the term came from a meeting held in the summer of 1956. Uh, John McCarthy uh, and Claude Shannon wrote a proposal um, and they imagined that with about 10 of them getting together for summer, they would make substantial progress uh, towards intelligent machines. So it took a bit longer than that. Um, and we've gone through a few cycles of hype uh, and disappointment. Uh, the first one in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, the second one, the expert system boom of the mid 80s. Uh, so there was just as much excitement about AI uh, in 1985 as there is now. 
Um, in fact, uh, at Stanford, where, where I was a student, 10% of the entire student body took the AI course in one, uh, in one quarter. Uh, so that just gives you a sense of how much excitement that was in 85. Um, and that boom dissipated because the technology wasn't ready for prime time. Uh, a lot of claims were made that were not really backed up by, by real rigorous science and technology. Um, and the current boom is the result of uh, deep learning, which was mentioned earlier. Uh, deep learning is a technology that's been around for about 20 years. So it means uh, essentially very large networks of simple uh, adjustable elements uh, whose weights can be tuned to fit a very large set of data. So you can, you can fit uh, a very large set of images that have been classified so that uh, this network will classify all those images correctly, and then we find that when you give it a new image to classify, it's able to do a very good job. So it can recognize um, animals, for example, at a higher rate of accuracy than humans. So even humans who have trained themselves for several weeks on the same kind of data, so machines are now exceeding human accuracy in recognizing objects in images. Um, in areas like machine translation, uh, we're seeing, uh, at least in some languages, not Chinese, unfortunately, but uh, in French and German, we're now seeing uh, comparable performance to an expert human translator. So these are things that uh, 10 years ago were actually unimaginable. Um, and in terms of Go, uh, two years ago, people thought it would take at least a decade to reach the level of professional Go players. And then a year later, we beat the world champion. Uh, so things are really moving very, very quickly, and that's given rise to a sense in the media that uh, Armageddon is around the corner. Yeah, right. Uh, and I'm here to tell you that it's not necessarily around the corner. Uh, <laughs> but I just want to finish with one little anecdote from the history of nuclear physics. So in, uh, uh, in 1933, actually on September 11th, 1933, uh, Ernest Rutherford, who was a uh, famous nuclear physicist, probably the, le the leading nuclear physicist of his time, said that there was absolutely no possibility that we would ever extract the energy that we knew to be stored in the atom. Uh, and then the next morning, Leo Zillard read a report of this speech in the Times, uh, and he went out for a walk. He crossed the road next to Russell Square. And by the time he got to the other side of the road, he had invented the nuclear chain reaction. He had realized that with that chain reaction, he could, he could create a nuclear bomb. Uh, he had sketched out in his mind the design of a nuclear reactor with all the feedback systems to contain the, the chain reaction. Um, and so it went from never to 16 hours. So when people say, oh, we don't need to worry because artificial intelligence is either never going to be achieved or will be achieved in you know, centuries into the future, um, I think that's an incautious uh, kind of prediction. So, so just to help clarify what changed between the 90s and now, so when IBM's Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov at chess in 1997, that was through a different set of technologies than the way that the... AlphaGo just beat the Go master. And what changed? What did the university contribute to the evolution of deep learning as opposed to machine learning? So deep learning is a branch of machine learning um, based on the, these, uh, these very large networks that have many, many layers, which is why they're called deep. Um, and surprisingly, uh, it turns out that with very simple algorithms, those networks can be trained to recognize incredibly complex functions. Uh, so one of them is, uh, how good is a Go position? And the system played itself millions of times uh, and learned to recognize the difference between winning Go positions and losing Go positions. Uh, and so it's actually a combination of the algorithms that Deep Blue use, which is to look ahead a long way uh, into the future to examine billions of possible future moves. But the ability to then recognize that that sequence of moves leads to a winning or losing position it was completely unexpected that uh, a network would be so good uh, at recognizing winning and losing positions. And interestingly, even if you get rid of all the search, so, so you don't look ahead at all. You just say, well, I could do this move, this move, or this move. And you look no further ahead than one move into the future. 
AlphaGo, with its ability to recognize winning and losing positions, would still beat, I would guess, everybody in this room at Go uh, without any thinking into the future at all. So its ability to recognize good and bad positions is uncanny, uh, and no one expected that to be possible. So we've heard a little bit about how inventions may really come from research and not necessarily from the com companies that help to commercialize them. Warren, could I turn to you and talk about the state of industry? Uh, obviously, when we think about commonplace artificial intelligence technologies that we're all familiar with, whether it's voice recognition technology or translation technology, the next thing that comes to mind for a lot of people these days is driverless cars, which of course you have to think about in your industry. But could you talk to us a little bit about how uh, y you think that industry is mm. approaching R&D in artificial intelligence and commercialization of the applications? Yeah, righto. So, uh, and, and some of this sort of is from current positions. Some of it is, is observations on the technology industry over the time I've spent in it. And actually, uh, some of what what Stuart said, I think, chimes well with our uh, experience of technology generally, that it, it normally does take longer for, um, for, for, for the promise to turn into reality than the number you first thought of. So, you know, like Stuart, I sort of entered the, the world of uh, technology in the early 80s, and um, expert systems, you know, a number of my, uh, my associates went off and... and worked in this exciting area of expert systems and then we didn't really hear anything about it for uh, for donkey's years after that um and you know that's a fairly sort of common uh, observation in in the tech space that you know, it takes longer than the number you first thought of but then when it happens it happens really quickly so um and, and it tends to happen with a rattle and a roar and much quicker than anybody expected uh, my previous company, Arm, provided the the, the microprocessors uh, to uh, to all Apple's uh, handheld things, and uh, basically the uh, the iPad and you know, appeared remarkably quickly. So we all thought, you know, it it was 2007 an iPhone, 2010 an iPad, and by 2012, then you know everybody on the planet, not quite, but a lot of people in San Francisco at any rate. Uh, had, it is uh, a planet. <laughs> had iPads. Um, but actually, ARM was founded in 1990 uh, on the back of uh, the Apple Newton, which was essentially an iPad without the internet. Uh, and, uh, and, and so it was a great promise, but it really took quite a long time for that promise to turn into reality. And that's what tends to happen in industry. And so, because industry and, and businesses, it's a competitive environment, you know that you know, your competitors are going to go for new technology. New technology generally leads to an increase in productivity. That generally leads to uh, a competitive advantage of some kind. And so you, you get involved in it, and you know that it's going to be a long time before you actually get a payback from doing it. And so companies uh, like, like the company I work for at the moment in Rolls-Royce, you know, the aerospace industry, very long time cycles. Um, we started putting sensors in, in engines um, uh, probably 20 plus years ago. Uh, to start extracting data about the, about the health of the engine. And if you get on an aeroplane today and it's an engine that's 20 or so years old, then there's probably uh, half a dozen sensors and um, you collect some data uh, when the aeroplane takes off and you collect a bit of data when the aeroplane's in the cruise and you collect a bit of data um, when the aeroplane comes down on the ground. If you get on a a brand new uh, Airbus A350 with one of our brand new engines on now. There's probably um, an order of maybe two orders of magnitude, or somewhere between one and two orders of magnitude more um, more sensors, uh, and um, there's there's a whole load more more data uh, collected. And is that revolution? Is that evolution? I don't know, but I know that it gives us. Um, it allows us to, to, to be competitive, uh, and it also allows us to deliver a better service to 
our customers. It en enables them to, uh, to operate their engines with, uh, with greater efficiency. Uh, and more importantly, it enables them to keep their operations uh, running well because, um, because we're able to predict uh, failure of engines before the failure actually happens. Um, so not only do we improve the operational efficiency, we sort of improve the safety as well. Um, so that, that's where we are in, in our industry. And uh, this type of intelligence is pervading you know, loads of industries. And my previous company, Arm, we provided the microprocessors in lots and lots of these sensors and got exposure to lots and lots of different industries. Everyone's at a slightly different, different point. Some industries are, are more advanced in uptake than others, uh, but everybody's pursuing the goal. And um, yeah, I'm sure we go on to some of the social implications in a while, but that's probably enough for now. Well, I think we should turn to the social implications right now. It's a good turning point. <laughs> uh, Stuart, you raised the idea that some people think this is Armageddon, that this is the potential introduction of dystopia because Artificial intelligence can be misused. It can lead to concentration of power. It can, it will destroy jobs. Robots will replace humans, and human beings will be left with very little to do uh, if all of this were a success. And uh, notwithstanding, there are obviously limits to artificial intelligence. To go back to the Go story, the uh, the commentator observed that the contest does little to prove that software can mollify an angry coworker, write a decent poem raise a well-adjusted child, or perform any number of distinctly human tasks. So maybe the hope that to avoid Armageddon is AI can only do so much. But what's your view? Is it, is it the key to human abundance and flourishing, or is there a dangerous possible descent of mankind? Uh, both. <laughs> and, um, and I think we need to not think about this as a forecasting problem, but as a, a steering problem. Um, so there are, there are downsides to any very powerful technology. Uh, we're already seeing the use of AI to do persuasion of individuals on a mass, a mass customized scale. Um, and uh, I, I raised it as a possibility in uh, Davos in 2015, uh, but just as a possibility, uh, and I had no idea that uh, it was already going on uh, and accelerated dramatically to have uh, you know, a large geopolitical impact. Um, I think you know, autonomous weapons is another big area where uh, things are moving very, very quickly. Uh, and the UN, fortunately, managed to get the member states to agree to begin a treaty to ban autonomous weapons, um, but it took we had to drag the US and Russia kicking and screaming uh, into that process before they would agree to let it go forward. Um, I think we have a lot of expertise on the panel about the question of, of employment, the structure of the economy, um, and uh, the dystopia there is, is very simple, that uh, not immediately, but I would say within the next 10 to 15 years, the both the physical and the mental labor of most people on Earth will become obsolete. And then you have to ask, so what role will people play? What useful function can they have? Um, and governments seem to have the view that, oh, we'll just retrain everyone as a data scientist or a robot engineer. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, and I, was, I was discussing this with, with um, uh, a permanent secretary of, of the economy ministry in Singapore, uh, and she was, that was the view that Singapore is taking. And I said, well, you know, think of the world as a, as a giant cruise ship, and there's one tiny lifeboat, which is billion data scientists and robot engineers. And she's, she was, she's a very intelligent woman. She said, that's fine, but Singapore is very small. We can fit, we can fit in the lifeboat. <laughs> um, and, uh, so, so there needs to be a radical change in the way we think about uh, what people will be doing in the future. So after your physical and, and mental labor, at least in, in the routine sense, that we have been using humans as robots for the last couple of hundred years, 
Um, so of course, machines are going to be able to do those jobs because they are designed to be routine, uh, to be plug and play replaceable. You know, can replace a human with another human because the job is so well defined and predictable and routine. Um, but what we have left, I think, is is the fact that we're human beings and that we can contribute to each other's quality of life uh, in a wide variety of ways. Um, and I think that's what most of us are going to be doing uh, in the future. And that doesn't seem to be a dystopian future, but it's one we have to prepare for and start preparing for now, right? Stop, I mean, I don't think we should stop training people to be data scientists, but don't imagine we need a billion of them. Uh, try and figure out, we need a, a new science base for how do you successfully improve the quality of life of other people, you know, all the way from childcare. Right? At the moment, childcare is one of the lowest paid professions with almost no science base on how to do a good job. There is very little training, there are no credentials, um, except for the Victorian nanny credential. Um, and yet, it's one of the most important things you can do to improve the quality of life of human beings, is to give them the right kind of upbringing. Uh, so, um, we need to work very hard to create new education systems, new science base, and then the new economic structures that make that a functioning economy, uh, where most people will be self-employed and providing personal services to other human beings to enhance their quality of life. Uh, so that's you, completely different from what we do now. You, you, you cautiously think it could be utopian rather than dystopian future. If we, if we get it right, yeah. right? I mean, right. We, we could see, if we, going, if we keep on going the way we're going, we will see continued increase in economic inequality, inequality. Uh, we may see uh, a, a revolution of a very different kind, uh, right. where well, people get fed up and say, we've had enough of this. Uh, <laughs> and that, that may end up with some really bad outcomes. Warren, let me turn next to you. Same question. Key to abundance, increased efficiency, uh, decreasing health costs rather than increasing health costs. Uh, greater efficiency in the way that we produce and consume goods, or or just the loss of jobs. I mean, if mm. you could talk about some of the, you, you've been in industrial sectors where human beings are being replaced by technology, maybe that's not so new, but is this going to be something on a bigger scale than ever before? Yeah, I, I think um, the thing that is worrying is probably the scale and, as Murat opened, um, the, the, the compression of time. But, you know, I do wonder, and I am a bit of an optimist about this, I, I do wonder um, if that's simply a matter of us adapting, i.e. it's a steering problem, not, not, uh, not anything else. You know, there's a spectrum, looking at the people in the room, there's a spectrum of age. And so, you know, I, I would imagine that, um, some people in the room uh, sort of perceive time um, passing a little bit quicker than, than others. And um, so similarly, as a, as a sort of society, we get used to things happening faster uh, as society moves on. So, you know, we've undoubtedly faced these sorts of challenges before with our previous um, in industrial revolutions. And um, I would imagine that we will similarly adapt, uh, and as Stuart just outlined, um, adapt ourselves to, to basically find other things to do. And goodness knows, th there are a lot of challenges around. And so I, w I would like to see us apply this greater um, technology, not just to things like better childcare, but you know, making sure that when we have this fantastic life of abundance, um, we do actually have enough water on the planet to drink, we do have enough food on the planet to drink, and we are operating in a way that doesn't end up cooking the planet uh, uh, as we go. So there are some quite big um, societal challenges around that we need to deploy some of this, uh, this better technology um, to address. And as far as jobs are concerned, you know, it's one of them, but, um, but we've shown in the past that we're able to address that. Uh, and the other scary bit is, is the pace, and that I don't know, but I'm guessing um, that, that we will find a way of adapting to that, just as we have found in the past, because actually all these other revolutions have happened much faster um, as, as things have gone along. And, um, 
you know, even even the notion of of decades now, just just a hundred years ago, um, things were, were already happening quite fast, and we were able to adapt to them uh, then and go back. You know, a, a thousand years, and things were happening a bit more slowly. But you know, a hundred years ago, it took just twenty years from the first manned flight to the forerunner of British Airways being formed, for instance. Uh, and twenty years doesn't seem like that long a, a, a time period. Now, it, it can't have seemed like that long a time period then. Murat, same question. Uh, key to abundance, efficiency, human flourishing, better approach to the planet, or a destructive displacement of what human beings have always done? I'm an optimist, uh, and I think we should distinguish between the, what's good for the society overall will not be good for some parts of the society. Uh, a few examples, using uh, precision agriculture. We can implant uh, devices in the field and instead of just spraying the same amount of water and fertilizers across the whole vast amounts of field, we can do precision, uh, like medicine, uh, farming and improve triple, quadruple the yields. And that has a huge impact in small, for smallhold farmers in Africa. If you look at uh, the land title ownership, this is not AI, but it's blockchain. I think blockchain has the same, if not more, revolutionary impact potential as the World Wide Web has had. I think it will be exponentially more. 70% uh, of the world population do not have the title to the land they own. And they're susceptible to corruption, uh, forced movement. And if with blockchain we can fix that problem, and it can be technically fixed very, very rapidly, 70% of the population, billions of people can participate in the economy. It will be a huge lift for these people to participate. Uh, one and a half billion people, 1.8 billion people don't have access to sanitation. We can do portable toilet production using 3D printing. We can deliver that. Uh, in Rwanda, they're using drones, um, slingshot drones, to deliver blood supplies to remote villages. They don't have to build roads and highways and get the cars and trucks they can deliver care in a much, much faster uh, fashion. I think with deep learning and access to genomic data from around the world, if you just work on Chinese or UK or American, you'll have biased data. But if we can combine the data sets and put deep learning on it, we can cure cancer. We can accelerate time to discovery. We can improve agriculture yield. We can improve the environment. Uh, if you look at the uh, oceans, by 2030, if I'm not mistaken, there will be more plastic by weight in the oceans than fish. And plastic degrades in, uh, takes 100 years for plastic to degrade and then the particles do not dissolve. There are now startups driven by young people who are putting uh, remote control vehicles, tracking where the plastic is and collecting them and storing them, which we couldn't even think about before. So I believe in the ingenuity, as uh, uh, you said, Warren, of the human being, and particularly the young generation. And as they're equipped with this knowledge, as they have access to all kinds of research in different languages, because it will be translated, we will accelerate time to discovery and time to impact. There will be parts of society, like with autonomous cars, drivers will lose their jobs. Uh, and I think uh, if you look at healthcare, it's 17% of the US economy. If you can cut the healthcare cost spending by half, then the government can reallocate this amount to reskilling the people or providing a social security net. So, as Russell said, we need to rethink how we steer, and we cannot go incremental. We need to take a holistic approach. We need to look at the society, industry, academia, um, the in international organizations. We all have to put our heads together and formulate a better future for all of us. So I'm very struck, Murat, that you talked about what we can do, and then you said we have to talk about the difference between society and perhaps government, industry, and academia. So maybe I could close by asking you each to tell us what you would say if you could tell government what to do, if you could tell industry what to do, and if you could tell universities what to do to respond in a way that will steer us more toward the utopian than the dystopian aspects of this. Murat, would you want to start with what, gover what, what would you tell governments to do uh, in order to better harness this problem to human good? I would say don't go incremental. 
don't look at the world as a, from a vertical health, agriculture, transportation, uh, production perspective. Look at it from a horizontal perspective. Look at these enabling technologies and how we can accelerate the improvement of the lives of the people. And uh, incrementalism is not the way to go. It's not evolution. It, it has to be revolution. And they have to work with uh, the rest of the society together and in a very, very rapid fashion to formulate these solutions. And would you be comfortable with a large government investment, the creation of, of government research facilities or government production facilities? I don't think it's about uh, who spends the money, because as Russell said, there's the <laughs> plenty of investing. I think governments can be the facilitators for accelerating this. And just one example. In healthcare, it's illegal in the United States for a physician to perform uh, health care services across state lines. So you cannot have an expert diagnose and prescribe solution across state lines. It's written into the code. You have to be certified in the same state. And that gets in the way of me or any one of us getting access to the same, uh, to the best physician. So there are some really small things the governments can do to change existing policies, and that can be done quickly. But it's impossible for the government to, it's impossible for anyone to know everything about everything. So we shouldn't rely on government knowledge because that's impossible. Their cycle time is much slower than the cycle time of innovation. What we can do is actually convince them, and in my experience, having spoken with pretty much every government except for North Korea, uh, whether uh, you're from Russia or United States or Indonesia or Rwanda or Japan or South Africa or uh, anywhere in the planet, everybody, all the policymakers are interested in improving the quality of life of their citizens. Everybody is interested in giving a better uh, future for the students who are, uh, or the, for the kids living in their society. They're all interested in making sure that uh, environments uh, we protect the environment, whether you believe in climate change or not, they want to provide a better environment. And you go to Beijing, you'll see that. Everybody's interested in making sure that the uh, society benefits from the policies they have, and they're all looking for solutions. So I think you can ignore the geopolitical statements, but if you go down to the reality, uh, people living in uh, Far East Russia and people living in Midwest United States or in poorer countries, they all have the same aim. And we see the governments to be very, very, very eager to collaborate. And I think uh, they're willing to put their heads together, come together, and that's what we're trying to facilitate with the center here in San Francisco. Warren, if you were to counsel the heads of industry on how to make better use of artificial intelligence, what would you tell them? Carry on doing what you're doing. Um, competing, uh, don't shy away from it, embrace it. Um, Align, align goals with, uh, with making, using technology to, to make life better for, for people rather than just the pursuit of profit. And actually, if you align your goals like that, then the profit will come. And it is important that industry does generate profit and does generate wealth. We are, we are talking about, you know, at least in the short term, um, that people people in some jobs no longer having those jobs and as a society we do need to uh, protect those people and the money has to come from somewhere. Uh, it's all very well for to talk about you know, what we need to encu encourage governments to do um, but generally it costs governments money uh, to do that and they have to raise the money from somewhere and they typically raise it from individuals working and from companies uh, making, making profits so it's essential that business does actually generate that, uh, that, that wealth. Uh, and I would also encourage business, as, uh, as, as we do, for instance, in our business, to, um, to work with governments and work with universities so that, uh, so that we solve, um, solve the downsides uh, together and, and benefit from the upsides together. Well, that leads us to close the discussion where we began with the university. It's, after all, the university that has brought us all together and the things that Oxford is doing and the things that Berkeley is doing that are among the great universities of the world in this field. And uh, Stuart, what, what should universities be doing better with the steering problem? Uh, so we're doing what we are uh, 
always doing, which is raising money. <laughs> uh, and um, fortunately, uh, the Open Philanthropy Foundation gave a very large grant to Berkeley for the, it's called the Center for Human Compatible AI, uh, which means AI that's compatible with human existence. Um, and so we're, we're working on some of the, actually the very long-term problems. So what happens when uh, AI systems exceed human capabilities across the broad spectrum uh, of what humans can do? Um, and so when you hear the Armageddon stories of Elon Musk talking about summoning the demons or, or Bill Gates and Stephen Hawking and so on, uh, they're talking about that. Uh, they're not talking about the employment issue or the killer robot issue, they're talking about the possibility of losing control uh, to machines that are more intelligent than human beings. Um, and with our current conception of what AI is, which means uh, building systems that are increasingly good at achieving objectives uh, in the real world, uh, that seems to be a real risk because um, we call this the King Midas problem. Uh, so King Midas gave an objective, which is, I want everything I touch to turn to gold. He got exactly what he asked for. Um, he, and that's the, it was the wrong objective, but it was too late. All right? His food and his drink and his daughter all turned to gold, and he died in misery and starvation, uh, precisely because he put the wrong objective into the machine. Uh, and the machine was more capable than he was. Uh, so that's the problem that underlies the concern that Elon Musk and Bill Gates are, are talking about. We don't know how to put the right objective into the machine. Um, so we're actually working on some technical solutions, machines that, uh, that are permanently uncertain about what objective it is, is that they're supposed to be achieving. <laughs> uh, and, and it turns out that actually uh, w when you define things the right way, you can make uh, you can make such machines, and they are provably beneficial to us. Uh, we are provably better off with those machines because essentially they never do anything unless they are sure that it is what we really want. Um, so that's a very long-term technical goal, and, and we'll be another 20 years trying to figure out all the ramifications of that. But I'm reasonably optimistic uh, on that point. But on the economic point, this is not really something that AI can solve, right? I think. Um, Industry and, and AI researchers and universities will continue to make advances, and there's nothing you can do to stop that. Um, and uh, the issue is, if we want to steer, we have to have a destination. And at the moment, uh, when you ask economists, you know, what should we do? You know, it's always incremental. Oh, you need, you know, more tax or less tax or, you know, earned income, whatnot. And um, there they're not able, because they're not a synthetic discipline, they don't invent futures. They don't invent new kinds of economy. That's not what they do. There is no uh, economy design 101 class in econ departments. Um, and so Murat and I are actually uh, scheming to bring together economists and science fiction writers uh, and for, you know, put them in a room for a, a week and say, you come out with a future that is, you know, economically consistent and viable, uh, and desirable from the point of view of most of the human race. Uh, and then we can steer towards it. Um, because at the moment, no one has such a future uh, that I can see. And um, that's, so that, that's what we're planning to do. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion, but there's tremendous amount of knowledge and talent in the room out here. We wanted to take questions from the audience. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to ask you, if you'd like to ask a question, I'll take three questions at a time, and then we'll throw them to the panel. And we hope that the, uh, that will generate a rich dialogue. So who wants to start? In the back, can you say, stand up, say who you are, and ask the question. Uh, my name is Richard Price. Um, there's mainly a question for Stuart. And the question is about when people talk about, say, superintelligence, there are often two schools of thought that are one is the school of thought where you try to decode into the operating system of the AI some ethical principles and such, but then the AI becomes very powerful and so it's almost the nerve. And the other school of thought says, look, you just can't, there's too much of a risk, but our sort of basic ethical principles are already risk to hand and we survive. And the other school of thought is kind of associated, I think, with Elon Musk, which is you've got to maintain intellectual character with the AI. What kind of 
Okay, so the, as between two schools of thought, which do we need to do? Do we need to try to train AI to be subordinate or do we need to be equal to it? I'm paraphrasing greatly, but let's take another question and we'll keep going. Yes, say, stand up and say who you are. Uh, I'm David Rowe. Uh, you've talked about the importance of steering. You've talked about the acceleration of AI, which sounds a bit like Henry Adams. But you've also talked about the competitive environment. My question is a political one. What are the implications of AI in the political context, which is also very competitive? Okay. And what are the implications of AI in the political context is the second question. And we'll take one more. Yes. Uh, hi. Um, my name is Li Yuan. I'm a global scientist. And I'm an AI researcher. Um, my question is, uh, based on my knowledge and understanding, the deep learning of artificial intelligence was enabled or had a second wave or third wave of, uh, of popularity because um, the availability of a large amount of data and the faster computers and computational powers. The, the thing is, as I or normal people or people on the street, we don't have access to this data. Or any of the tools, how can interpret this data? And I think that could hold the key to how to make um, a data-driven or artificial intelligence enable the society in the future to be uh, you know, solve the problem of certain inequality. So what's your comment on that? Okay. So how can we use access to data to solve problems of inequality, and how do we ensure that the computational methods and data is available to do so? So, Stuart, do you want to lead off with the first question? Um, okay, so the first question has to do with, uh, so Elon Musk uh, and Ray Kurzweil and various other people are saying, uh, we will become cyborgs, uh, we'll upload our brains into machines, and that way we can keep up with them. Uh, I think this is completely nutty. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Elon is a, is a friend of mine, but um, I, I, I don't want to be in that world. I don't want my children to be in a world where they have to uh, you know, fill their heads full of chips just in order to keep up. Um, so I think that we have no choice but to figure out how to design AI so that it remains uh, on our side. Um, and it, it's, it's actually it's a little different from putting ethical principles into the machine. It's enabling the machine to learn to predict which, what we want, basically which life we, we would prefer to live and then helping us uh, achieve that choice. And um, so I would recommend this, this uh, story to everyone when I give talks about this is uh, a story by E.M. Forster written in 1909. So he usually writes, you know, historical frock dramas and things like that. But he wrote a science fiction story called The Machine Stops. Um, and it has in it the internet, iPads, video chat, MOOCs, uh, and, uh, and also uh, computer-induced obesity. Uh, so it predicted pretty much everything about our, our, <laughs> our, our current time. Um, it's really remarkable in that way. And, uh, and what happens in that future is that humanity becomes increasingly dependent and increasingly enfeebled. Uh, so it's a little bit like what happens in Wall-E, if you've seen Wall-E and all the people on the spaceship becoming obese and, and useless. Um, and so if machines understand us well enough, they will know that that's a temptation for us uh, to want to have everything done. And they should say, do it yourself, right? They should stay in the background and let us make mistakes, facilitate the availability of choices. Most people uh, in the world have almost no choice about anything um, because of their economic circumstance and their political circumstance. Um, but I want machines to, to leave freedom of choice and autonomy to, to the human race. Warren, Murat, either, either answer either question. Um, well, shall I have a go at the... Um... The political one then, um, and, and, and competitiveness. Uh, I mean, at a very simple level, of course, uh, you could imagine the political system that, that we have, say, um, here in the US or in, in, in much of Western Europe and, uh, and, and different factions actually deploying 
uh, AI to help them with their existing political uh, aims. But I think um, I think that's sort of a, a kind of naughty example of the the way that people would use it. You know, a better approach uh, would be to uh, to win those battles on the basis of how um, how the political uh, Political. Um, I'm trying to think of the right the right word here, but uh, let, let's call it a propo a, a party in a in a system um, in in a Western democracy. How how one particular uh, faction versus another faction would propose to the society to use AI and use relationships with with universities uh, and with businesses to to make a better society to do what we said we actually wanted governments to do. Um, and you know, I think that'd be a constructive way of um, of the uh, the political competitiveness embracing uh, embracing AI. And then, if you think about political competitiveness between countries, then um, you know, perhaps uh, perhaps that's one where again we we sort of end up competing for uh, for resources, but but using using AI to end up with with uh, a, a better um, a better solution for individual countries, and I hope we don't get to that. I hope you know it doesn't become um, a weapon, if you like. But uh, I fear that's potentially one of the downsides of political competitiveness and AI. Murat, do you I'll want to take, take on another? the data one? So <laughs> uh, people have said data is the new currency, or data is the new oil. And with deep learning and vast amounts of data, I think we can really make enormous progress. And if you look at the Internet of Things, they're the best source of data because they're everywhere, they're connected, and they collect a lot of data. And I was having a conversation with the chief minister of an Indian state, and he said, Murat, I'm wiring my whole capital with uh, uh, everything is uh, on the Internet. I'm collecting huge amounts of data from light bulbs, from traffic signals, etc." And I said, Chief Minister, how do you know that it's a light bulb? And he said, what do you mean? I said, how do you know that it's a light bulb that's producing the data? He said, well, it has an IP address. Uh, I said, well, that's not sufficient. We need to authenticate it. So if we rely on data, I think we should look at fake data as we look at fake news. Okay. So one of the initiatives we have at the center here is if you look at the data as a source of all possible good, is the authentication of the thing. How do you know that the thing is the thing that it's, it claims itself to be? And there is no uh, industry association. It's not uh, jet engine manufacturers. It's not toy manufacturers. It's not car manufacturers, light bulb manufacturers. It's everybody. It's not IEEE. It's not, uh, again, World Health Organization. It's not International Telecommunications Union. It's not all of these standards. It's everybody. It's all the academia. So our goal, one of our first projects at the center, is to come up with a uh, authentication mechanism for the thing at the API level uh, that's distributed, dynamically uh, available, real-time, low latency, not under any government control, and trusted by everyone. Because that's the lifeline of the planet. And maybe blockchain is a uh, platform for that. So that's our second project. Going back to the ethics and values question, uh, the question is how do we prevent the thing from doing something that's harmful to the society? And there we're looking into the ethics and values. And uh, Will I Am of uh, Black Eyed Peas talks about the Love API. So we're looking at it uh, from a technical perspective to see if we can actually uh, prevent the thing from doing something that's harmful to the society. And there is an analogy in history. If you look at the electrification, when electricity was distributed, people had all kinds of uh, um, frequencies uh, uh, 50 or 60 and or voltages and you would plug in an appliance and it would burn the whole building down so it really harmed a lot of people then the insurance uh, industry got together here in the US and said we need to have a standard on what happens when you have too much voltage and the underwriter laboratories was created it was an industry initiative driven by insurers and they put this thing called the circuit breakers so we want to define a software circuit breaker, the ethics and value switch when it comes to data. Then if you go to the next level, which is data ownership, 
who owns the data. And uh, what your engines are doing, Warren, is breaking laws in many jurisdictions. Because a lot of countries say, the data you collect in my country cannot leave my country. But the engines flying over all over the world are breaking the law, and that was not the intent. And we have one partner, uh, one company that uh, is, again, the instrumenting the fields in agriculture. And if they have access to global data sets from agriculture from the fields, they can improve the yields. They can commit to yields. But one country in Africa told them the data they collect cannot leave their country. When we talk to the Ministry of Agriculture or Minister of Health and say, look, it's in your interest to share the data so that you can benefit from the outcome, they say, well, I didn't know that. So the content is key, but the context is also very important. So we need to provide a context for the people to, for the policymakers to adjust their viewpoints. And they're very willing to do that. They say, well, I didn't know. Then when they know, they can take a different view. And the final point in data ownership is cross-border data flows. If you can 3D print a drone, you're not physically moving material. You're moving a lot of IP, intellectual property, electrons. And uh, Jack Ma of Alibaba uh, keeps talking about EWTO, World Trade Organization, for the movement of electrons. And that also has to be figured out. And again, we see a, a reality-driven need uh, that the governments are willing to collaborate on. So it's identification of the things, ethics and values, data ownership, cross-border data flows. Th those have to be addressed. Julie, with your permission, we can take a few more questions. Okay. Yes. One, we'll go one, one, two. Second row, first row. Yeah, well, my name is Richard Green. Uh, I have a question regarding not so much will humans be willing participants in this process, but really not willing participants in the process. For example, today we have more data than ever about health, but why is obesity on the rise? There are example after example of essentially illogical decisions on mass. And so the rise, for example, in politics recently of, of nationalism, essentially protectionist ideologies, suggests that people will be resistant to some of this innovation. Could some of you talk about the role that regulation governments might play in actually slowing down the implementation of technology that potentially could make life, as we've said, easier so will people be willing or unwilling participants in this these developments and will would there actually would it be desirable in some cases for government to try to slow down technologies in order to prevent bad human reactions to it i'm paraphrasing poorly i'm just doing this because we're filming and so now we'll take a question from the front row I'm Jill Fraser Crowley, and I just am curious too that you, know, you speak about the sort of ability to constrain an artificial intelligence or to uh, make sort of modifications in time. But if you have a number of different entities working on these machines, your intentions might be very honorable. Your intentions might be to create something that is perhaps not so honorable, but with so many sort of public and private entities, how do you manage this and how do you develop some sort of a policy that would potentially guide it in a direction that you know, we would choose as opposed to you know, super intelligence or, or really cheap? So should policy help to determine uh, the use of technology, which left to a decentralized set of devices, might be done by some for positive ends, by others for adverse ends. Is there a way to have a kind of overarching policy that selects between them? Why don't we stop there and throw those out to the group? Who wants to start? Uh, so I'll, I'll address that question. Um, so what we in the last uh, 12 months, we've seen incredible changes in the attitude of industry and government to these questions. So the partnership on AI uh, was announced uh, maybe eight months ago, I think. Um, and that has the five largest tech companies in the world. Uh, they have committed themselves to uh, develop standards to ensure that AI is beneficial, uh, to share 
the technology as it develops towards super intelligent capabilities. Uh, and they've subscribed to a whole list of principles uh, about you know, equitable distribution of the, of the resulting wealth uh, and so on. Um, the United Nations is running its first global AI summit in a couple of weeks in Geneva. Um, the White House under President Obama uh, created an AI initiative. And I just heard, in fact, that the Trump White House is looking for uh, an AI uh, czar to come in and make sure that AI policy moves in a sensible direction. But I don't know anyone who's signed up for that job. <laughs> uh, so, um, but I would say that uh, the acceptance of these developments depends uh, to a great extent on, on what the government does to protect people from uh, the bad actors. And I would say we should, you know, we can think about what might happen with AI in the future, but we can look at the present and say what is happening with cybersecurity. And the answer is a complete and utter catastrophe. Um, I'm, I, hands up anyone who's been a victim of you know, either phishing attacks, taking money out of your, your bank account, uh, your AT, you know, misuse of your ATM information, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? A lot of people, right? So if I asked you how many, how many of you have been victim of an armed robbery, oh, none. Look at that, right? But we spend probably 50 times as much money preventing armed robbery as we do preventing uh, cybercrime. Just a little statistic. The second largest source of foreign currency, currency for Russia is cyber theft. Direct exfiltration of cash from bank accounts in foreign countries. A hundred billion dollars a year. Um, large companies that used to do millions of financial transactions with their customers and suppliers over the internet are abandoning the internet and requiring that those transactions be done with handwritten faxes with voice confirmation. So that just tells you how bad things are. We are in the process of losing the internet as a major economic tool uh, because governments have completely failed uh, to police the situation, to reduce the incentives for crime, to create forensic traceability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone uh, in the cybersecurity area knows what should be done. Uh, but it requires governments to coordinate. Uh, the Russian government isn't going to help because they make a ton of money off it. Uh, but I think uh, you know, y y this has been a complete failure of concerted action. Uh, and if that happens again with AI, uh, where, where people are victimized by, by AI, I mean, it's, it's already happening. I, I was talking to a cybersecurity person, and I say, you know, I worry that people might start using AI to do personalized blackmail, where the AI would read your emails and look at your browsing behavior, figure out what you were doing that was wrong, uh, and then start blackmailing you. And he said, oh, that's already happening, right? And when that happens on a mass scale, right, when everyone here has been a victim of that kind of thing, you know, people are just going to get completely fed up and, and say, enough, we don't want this technology because it's just made our lives worse. And the fascinating question about what if AI gives us capabilities that human beings refuse to embrace? What if we could solve healthcare problems but don't? What sort of response do Warren or Murat, do either of you have to that question? I can take it on. You mentioned obesity. Um, the non-communicable diseases, it's cardiovascular and uh, um, diabetes. They, it kills 38 million people a year. And half of that is preventable with uh, lifestyle changes and the other half is genetic that's where precision medicine comes in and that's again one of our focus areas at the center is to look at uh, genetic code which is now being deciphered very very rapidly and identify the genes because it is a disease that can be cured with genetic modification but I think we have to take a look at it in a more systemic fashion and go back to what happens to the human brain in early childhood. The human brain develops fastest physiologically between the ages one and three. And what you teach the kids at that in those ages and what you feed them sets them for the rest of their lives. If you feed them carbs and sugar, then they don't have the capacity to connect the, make the connection in the, in the future. And if you teach them to learn to learn, and this is based on the work that we have done in Future of Health and Future of Skills, 
if you teach them to learn to learn, learn to fail, learn to collaborate, learn to communicate in, in that age group, then you set a very positive path. And if you look at the healthcare spend uh, by, look at any country, it's a huge proportion on curing these curable diseases. And the governments, given the financial conditions they're in, the investments they need to make, they're very willing to take a systemic view along with the healthcare industry, with the innovators, with the policymakers, with civil society to really tackle this issue. So I don't think there will be any objection from any government or policymaker. World Health Organization is fully behind that. And I think the individuals, as they see their lifestyles uh, declining, uh, they will adopt these uh, cures or approaches. And I don't think that will be a problem. Warren, I'm going to give the last word of the evening to you uh, to just tell us whether we should leave in a mood of cautious optimism. We'll leave in a mood of great enlightenment. But the reason I'm calling you uh, on you last is because you're wearing your wadham tie, which I just <laughs> noticed. And uh, you can give us the last word for the evening. Uh, right. -o. Well, I would advise everybody to be intrinsically optimistic, um, optimistic with care. Uh, and, you know, I could tie those last two questions together a bit and sort of say, well, actually, industry is pretty good at, um, at working with standards. If we look, you know, across multiple sectors and uh, across a long time, you know, standards do evolve and businesses do adopt them, basically because um, you know, the problems are too difficult for individual companies to solve on their own and you end up with better solutions with collaboration and standards facilitate collaboration. And so I'm quite optimistic that industry will embrace standards, therefore create better solutions and therefore um, encourage people to, uh, to actually not be resistant uh, to the changes. People will be resistant you know, for a while, but you know, an example would be the automotive sector um, in the 20th century and you know somebody invented cars uh, and you know absolutely great and all the boy racers drove around everywhere and started running people over and so you know people objected to that uh, because uh, you know it was causing causing a lot of problem uh, and then some standards evolved and it, it started out with you know having to be policed and man with a red flag and all the rest of it making making people go slowly and then they evolved standards that you know if you stick to this side of the road and that side of the road then you can actually go a little bit quicker without running into each other and without killing people uh and and so there's an adoption of a standard and then all the people who were sort of not really into these cars because they're very dangerous started started adopting the cars. So the lesson from that in the 20th century, I think we can apply um, in the 21st century and be intrinsically optimistic that uh, this technology is going to do more for us than, uh, than, than the motor car did in the 20th century. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Wadham College, I want to express great gratitude to all of you for attending tonight. Great gratitude to Toshiba and Daisho, our sponsors, for creating this superb event. And above all, thanks to this magnificent panel, Stuart, Warren, Murat. Let's thank them. And Julie, would you like to tell people what's in store for the rest of the evening? Thank you very, very much. Um, I think uh, Wadham College 17th century founders would have been very proud and very impressed, possibly puzzled too, if they'd been here tonight. But a huge thanks from all of us uh, to all of you. Um, we trust you to facilitate the creation of this uh, ethics and value switch. <laughs> Can we hold you to account? Um, it's been really exciting and fascinating. And please uh, join all of us uh, on the terrace, at the bar, have a drink, meet each other and connect. Um, there will be lots of more uh, activity in the Bay Area, in the region for the coming months and years. I don't know if all of you are aware that the North, North uh, American office and the uh, Oxford reunion that takes place every other year will take place in San Francisco in April 2018. So look out for it, more things will happen. We're also lucky to have Natalia uh, 
Shen uh, Mungan here this evening. Natalia, where are you? Natalia is down in the back. She's the president of the Northern California Oxford Association. Um, meet her at the bar or at the terrace live. Uh, but you also have the details at the back of this program uh, this evening. Uh, so you can connect with us, connect with the Northern California Association. But thank you very much for coming and enjoy each other's company. Thank you very much. <laughs>